16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of eating, or maybe just one meal a day. On the surface, they all fall under the same label, intermittent fasting. And because they share that label, most people assume they work the same way. But your body doesn't recognize labels, it responds to signals. And depending on how you fast, those signals can lead your metabolism in very different directions. Here's the uncomfortable truth most people never hear. Choosing a fasting method based on discipline alone can quietly work against you, not because you're doing it wrong, not because you lack willpower, but because your biology doesn't reward extremes the way social media makes you believe. Some fasting schedules help your body become more efficient, more stable, more resilient. Others create deeper stress that looks like progress at first, but slowly adds friction beneath the surface. And unless you understand what's actually happening inside your body, it's impossible to know which one you're triggering. When you eat, your body immediately shifts into processing mode. Food is broken down into glucose, which becomes your primary source of energy. At the same time, your pancreas releases insulin, a hormone designed to move that glucose from your bloodstream into your cells. As long as insulin is elevated, your body is focused on using and storing energy, not burning fat. This is an important point many people overlook. Fat doesn't disappear just because you decide to fast. It becomes available only after insulin levels fall and your body finishes using the fuel you've already given it. That transition doesn't happen instantly. It follows a predictable biological sequence, and understanding that sequence is the key to everything that follows. After you stop eating, your body doesn't immediately start burning fat. First, it relies on the glucose already circulating in your bloodstream. Once that's used, it turns to stored glucose inside your liver, known as glycogen. Your liver holds roughly enough glycogen to fuel your body for about a day under normal conditions. But that supply begins shrinking much sooner than most people realize. Somewhere between 10 and 14 hours without food, something important starts to happen. Your liver's glucose reserve runs low, and your body has to make a decision. It can't slow down your brain, and it can't shut off essential functions, so it switches fuel sources. Fat cells begin releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream, which travel to the liver and are converted into molecules called ketones. This is the metabolic switch. It's the point where your body shifts from relying on sugar to burning fat as its primary fuel. And this transition changes how your body feels. Energy becomes steadier. Blood sugar fluctuations smooth out, and for the first time since your last meal, stored fat becomes biologically accessible. Once your body begins producing ketones, the way you experience energy starts to change. Glucose is a fast fuel. It rises quickly, falls quickly, and often takes your focus and mood with it. Ketones work differently. They provide a slower, steadier source of energy that doesn't depend on constant refueling. This is why many people notice fewer crashes, less brain fog, and more consistent focus during fasting. Your brain, which normally relies heavily on glucose, can run very efficiently on ketones. In fact, ketones cross the blood-brain barrier easily and deliver energy in a more stable form. That stability is not just physical, it's mental. Thoughts feel clearer, attention feels more anchored, and hunger becomes quieter, not because your body is starving, but because it has finally switched to a fuel source designed to last. This is also why the timing of the metabolic switch matters so much. Reaching it briefly is one thing. Staying there long enough for your body and brain to benefit is another. And this is where different fasting schedules begin to separate in meaningful ways. With a 16 to 8 fasting schedule, this metabolic switch happens every single day, but only for a limited window. After roughly 16 hours without food, most people have used up enough liver glycogen to begin producing ketones. Your body enters fat-burning mode, but it doesn't stay there indefinitely. Instead, it spends a few hours relying on fat and ketones before you eat again. When you do, insulin rises, glucose becomes available, and the cycle resets. This daily rhythm turns fasting into a repeated signal rather than a prolonged stressor. Your metabolism practices switching fuels, then returns to a fed state before strain accumulates. For many people, this balance is exactly what makes 16 to 8 sustainable. 
You still eat regular meals. You still support training, recovery, and social life. But you also give your body a consistent break from constant insulin exposure. That break is what improves insulin sensitivity over time. Cells become better at responding to insulin, not overwhelmed by it. Fat loss happens gradually, muscle is preserved, and energy remains predictable. On paper, it may sound modest, but biologically, this repeated, controlled switch is doing far more work than it appears. With OMAD, the same metabolic switch happens, but the context around it changes dramatically. Instead of fasting for 16 hours, you're going 23 hours without food. That means once your body runs out of liver glycogen, it doesn't return to a fed state for a long time. Ketone production rises higher, and fat burning stays active for much longer. On the surface, this looks like a clear advantage. More time in ketosis, more hours burning fat, a deeper metabolic shift. And for a short period, many people do see faster changes on the scale. But there's another side to this equation that often gets ignored. When you eat only once per day, all of your calories arrive at the same time. Your digestive system has to process a large volume of food in a single sitting, and more importantly, your pancreas has to respond to a massive glucose load all at once. After nearly a full day of very low insulin, the body is suddenly forced to produce a sharp insulin surge. This contrast between prolonged fasting and one very large meal is what makes OMAD fundamentally different. It doesn't just extend fat burning. It also amplifies the metabolic swing that happens when you finally eat. After fasting for most of the day, many people assume their insulin response will automatically improve. It sounds logical. Less eating should mean lower insulin, better control, and healthier blood sugar. But with OMAD, the timing and size of that single meal changes the outcome. When you consume 1,500 to 2,500 calories at once, glucose enters the bloodstream rapidly. To manage that load, the pancreas has no choice but to release a large amount of insulin in a short period of time. This spike is much higher than what you'd see with smaller meals spread throughout the day. And here's where it becomes counterintuitive. That large insulin surge doesn't always resolve quickly. In some people, glucose from that meal is still being processed hours later, even into the next morning. This is why studies have observed higher fasting blood sugar in people eating one meal per day compared to those eating multiple meals. It's not because fasting failed. It's because the body was pushed from one extreme to another. Prolonged low insulin followed by a sudden overload creates metabolic stress that looks efficient on paper, but behaves very differently inside a real human body. The human body adapts best to challenges that come with recovery built in. That's true for exercise, sleep, and metabolism. When fasting becomes too extreme, that balance starts to break down. OMAD keeps the body in a prolonged fasted state, but then demands an enormous response all at once. Digestive organs are pushed to handle a large volume of food in a short time. Hormones swing from one end of the spectrum to the other. And instead of gentle metabolic training, the system experiences repeated shocks. Over time, this can show up as bloating, discomfort, irritability, or an uneasy relationship with food. It's not that the body can't handle fasting. It's that constant extremes reduce its ability to regulate smoothly. Some people interpret these signals as weakness or lack of discipline, when in reality, they're signs of physiological strain. A method that improves health should make the body more resilient, not more reactive. And this distinction matters, because what looks powerful in theory doesn't always translate into stability in daily life. One of the most overlooked effects of fasting has nothing to do with fat loss at all. It has to do with the brain. When your body begins producing ketones, those molecules don't just fuel muscles, they cross into the brain and trigger powerful adaptive responses. Ketones stimulate the release of a protein called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF supports the growth of new neurons, strengthens existing connections, and protects brain cells from stress. Higher levels of BDNF are associated with better memory, faster learning, and improved mood. This is why many people report feeling mentally sharper during fasting. It's not placebo, 
It's not motivation. It's a biological signal telling the brain to adapt and perform. From an evolutionary perspective, this makes sense. A hungry brain needed to be alert, focused, and capable of solving problems. But this benefit depends on balance. The brain responds best when fasting and feeding alternate in a predictable rhythm. When that rhythm becomes too extreme, cognitive benefits can flatten or even reverse. And this is where the concept of cycling becomes essential. The real benefits of intermittent fasting don't come from staying in a fasted state as long as possible. They come from cycling between two very different biological modes. During fasting, your body activates repair, efficiency, and protection mechanisms. During eating, it shifts into growth, recovery, and rebuilding. Both states are necessary. When they alternate in a predictable rhythm, your metabolism becomes more flexible instead of more fragile. This concept is often called cyclic metabolic switching, and it reflects how humans evolved. Food was never perfectly consistent, but neither was starvation. The body learned to adapt by moving back and forth between scarcity and abundance. That movement is what sharpened the brain, preserved muscle, and protected long-term health. When fasting methods eliminate one side of that cycle or push it to an extreme, the signal changes. Instead of adaptation, the body senses prolonged stress. The goal isn't to fast harder. It's to fast intelligently. And that distinction is what separates methods that build resilience from those that quietly wear the system down. For many people, 16 to 8 works not because it's extreme, but because it fits into real life. It allows the body to practice metabolic switching without turning fasting into a constant strain. This approach tends to work best for people who want consistency rather than intensity. If you exercise regularly, need steady energy for work, or value sharing meals with family and friends, 16 to 8 creates structure without isolation. It also supports muscle preservation by allowing regular protein intake and recovery windows. Over time, the repeated drop in insulin improves insulin sensitivity and glucose control without forcing the body into large hormonal swings. Most importantly, it's sustainable. People can follow it for months or years without feeling disconnected from normal routines. That long-term adherence is often more powerful than any short-term metabolic advantage. Health isn't built in a single aggressive phase. It's built through patterns you can repeat calmly day after day. And this is where 16 to 8 quietly excels. OMAD isn't inherently wrong, but it is far more selective in who it works for. This approach tends to suit people who have already adapted to fasting and understand how their body responds to long fasts. It may appeal to those with extremely busy schedules who prefer simplifying food decisions or individuals pursuing short-term fat loss under careful medical supervision. But OMAD demands precision. Getting enough protein, fiber, and micronutrients in a single meal is challenging, and mistakes add up quickly. More importantly, some people should not attempt this method at all. Anyone with a history of disordered eating, blood sugar instability, digestive issues, or cardiovascular concerns is far more likely to experience harm than benefit. The same is true for pregnant or breastfeeding women, teenagers, and individuals who are already underweight. When a fasting method requires constant monitoring just to remain safe, it stops being a lifestyle tool and becomes a clinical intervention, and that distinction matters more than most people realize. At the end of the day, Fasting is not a test of discipline. It's a conversation with your body. And the body is always responding, whether you're paying attention or not. Energy levels, mental clarity, sleep quality, and how you feel after eating are all feedback signals. They tell you whether a method is building resilience or quietly creating friction. The science matters, but so does awareness. A fasting schedule that improves your health should make your life feel more stable, not more restrictive. It should sharpen your focus, not dominate your thoughts. The goal isn't to follow fasting perfectly. The goal is to use it intelligently. When fasting supports your biology instead of fighting it, the benefits compound naturally. So instead of asking which method is best, ask a better question. Which one helps your body work better tomorrow than it did yesterday? 
That answer is different for everyone, and it's worth listening for.